News Talk Radio, CJAD 800. Those against get into politics, they usually are very confident, they're powerful, they're ego-driven, and there have been a lot of books written by and about these politicians. Now a decidedly different take on the subject, a new book written by someone who rose to a leadership position with the Liberal Party of Canada, only to face defeat. When Harper's Conservative Party won the majority, he wrote a book about it all, Fire and Ashes, Success and Failure in Politics. It looks at this story, first-hand perspective of Michael Ignatieff in studio right now. Good morning. Nice to be here. Uh, take me back to that uh, first meeting uh, with those power brokers, or the men in black, as you called them, that meeting that uh, got the whole thing started. Well, I was minding my business down in uh, Harvard. I was teaching at the Kennedy School, and three Canadians showed up one October night. Uh, I didn't know any of them. Uh, and they said, would you like to run for office? I'd been a liberal all my life. I worked for Mr. Trudeau in 1968, but I'd been out of the country for a while, so it came absolutely out of the blue. Uh, they said they put together a team and uh, we'd uh, do great things together. And so the the book is really the story about why against even my own better judgment, I decided to take the plunge. I'm glad I did, but boy, I had a lot to learn. Now, what about the advice that your friends gave you at the time, the ones who told you, uh, don't do it? Uh, what did they say? What, what were the reasons they gave? Oh, they said, look, you've got a great job here. Um, uh, why put your reputation on the line, all this kind of stuff. It's safer to stay up in the stands, don't get onto the ice, you know. But I've been on, up in the stands for a long time. I thought, uh, let's get on the ice, let's put on our pads and get out there and skate. So it was, I think the initial idea was simply that I, I was going to do something that I knew was going to be very hard. I wasn't under, I wasn't, look, I was naive, but I wasn't completely naive. I knew that this was rough, tough, uh, difficult stuff, but I thought, uh, like you do, I, I think I possibly overestimated my own abilities and underestimated what I was in for, but I'm still glad I did it. What do you really think of Stephen Harper? <laughs> well, if, if you've faced him across the aisle in the House of Commons for years, what you, you, you notice, very disciplined, uh, very tough, um, He's got that caucus behind him by the scruff of the neck. Um, you have to admire that in politics. I, I disagree with almost everything he stands for, but I have to acknowledge his political skill. Uh, I don't think he's a nice person. I don't think he cares what you think about him. What he wants is your respect, not your love, and that's an enormous source of strength in politics. I, I never had quality time with a man, so I, so I don't know. but I. I think it's important as someone who got beat by him to acknowledge that he's a very effective politician. And many uh, political books that I've read, they're basically just uh, pablum, uh, just full of cliches. Uh, this book has all kinds of uh, guts in it, and lots of things, lots of surprising things. I can't get over uh, what I saw on uh, page 86 when you're talking about uh, the run for the leadership of the convention. Uh, and you're talking about Bob Ray, Bob Ray coming over, and you didn't know if he was going to shake your hand. Uh, t tell me what happened then. Well, that was a moment at the Palais de Congrès in, in Montreal in 2006 that some listeners may remember. It was an incredibly dramatic liberal leadership con convention in which Bob Ray and I and Stéphane Dion were competing for the top spot with some other great candidates. And uh, at the end of the third ballot, there was a question of whether the Ray camp would come over to me. And I walked over to the Ray camp and John Ray, uh, Bob's uh, brother, barred the way. And the look on his face, I've never forgotten. There was this look of kind of protecting the f tribal lair. You know, it was like it had, there, there was something elemental about his, you know, get back, don't come closer. And I put that in the book, not not to take a shot at the Ray family or Bob, but just to show ordinary readers what politics is like. It awakens incredibly deep tribal emotions in people, and those were really on display that at that moment. And it was an important moment because had the Ray camp come over, I might have won, and Mr. You know, I would have beaten Mr. Dion. Mr. Dion then beat me fair and square, and he became the leader. So it was a moment that had consequences. Uh, you admit you made mistakes uh, along the way. What was the biggest one from your point of view? Well, I think I shouldn't have moved in a no-confidence motion in the autumn of 2009. All of this nobody can remember, but it, 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 you, you can't 
vote for a budget in early 2009 and try and bring a government down in 2009. It makes you look as if you're just a com an opportunist. I, I think that was a strategic mistake. There are a bunch of others, and, and the point about writing the book and talking honestly about mistakes is I think that politicians often don't talk honestly about the stuff they, let me put it this way, screw up. But I think you have to, because there's so much cynicism about politics out there that I, you know, my kind of contribution to addressing that is simply say, look, we're human beings, we make mistakes, and when we when we mess up, it's important to, to say so publicly and, and take the responsibility. Uh, you know, I, I was leader of a party. I'm proud that I was the leader of a party. But, you know, we were defeated in 2011, and you got to shoulder responsibility for, for what went wrong, and I, and I do. If you, when, when you look uh, back at it, what was the most exciting part, the most positive aspect of it? Oh, the most exciting part is really easy. It's just meeting Canadians. You know, you, you, you work about 90 hours a week. You travel to every single part of the country. You take the country kind of into your heart and soul, and you're constantly meeting people who are astonishing. Let me just give you the flavor of that. You're in the interior of B.C., buying fruit at a fruit stand and you meet a 94 year old guy buying fruit with you and you say to him what's your secret for being 94 years old and living so long and he looks at you at a long time he says son sex and booze sex <laughs> and booze right i mean over and over again it was meeting people like that who just made you laugh made you astonished um people forget that about politics it really is a people business and when i look back on it now the stuff I remember is just meeting Canadians and learning from them and, you know, being astonished by them. Do you think uh, you were treated fairly by the media? Oh, of course not. I, you know, complained to the end of time about it. But no, I, if I'm honest and I look at the press corps in Ottawa, the young people who stick a microphone in front of your face, um, I have no quarrel with them. The professional journalists were fine. Columnists, you know, Sometimes I'd, I'd throw a paper across the room because I'd think, come on, guys. And, and what would bother me about it is what bothers every politician, which is journalists never put themselves on the line the way a politician does. You're the guy in the arena. You're the guy with the name on the ballot. You're the one who pays the consequences. So the irritation that people have with journalism is just they don't put the same things at risk that we do. But hey, They've got a job to do. I respected that, and and most of them were extremely fair. I mean, I don't, I, I can't, uh, uh, I haven't got an enemies list. Let me tell you that. Uh, tell me about the what you described as the coalition of losers. What happened with that situation? Well, in 2008, some of your listeners may remember that that uh, Monsieur Dion, Monsieur Duceppe, and Mr. Layton got together and put together a plan to bring down the Harper government. Uh, and I had no problem with coalition. I, th I think it's really important for the future of the country that, for example, the NDP and the Liberals could get together and they could do a coalition agreement the way they've done in Britain. So I've got no objection to coalition. I just thought in this case, it was a month after an election in which, you know, the Canadian people had sent the Conservative government back to the House of Commons with more seats. You can have a coalition of winners, but I don't think you can have a coalition of losers. Our conversation with Michael Ignatia of the book Fire and Ashes. Lots of interesting texts uh, coming in for you. Uh, it, it says, if we as Canadians had gotten to hear and know Mr. Ignatia as we are today on this program, he'd now be Prime Minister. <laughs> His candor and honesty and willingness to teach and take responsibility are refreshing. His personality wasn't allowed to come out during the campaign. How much truth is there to that? Well, that's incredibly nice to say, but uh, it's a politician's job to get that personality out there. And if you, if you don't get it out there, then you then you pay the consequences. It was very kind of you to say that you uh, say those nice things, and uh, I'd like lots more people to believe it. What could I say? Uh, this one says, M Mr. Iggy is proof that the general population is not able to handle an intellectual in office. You need a brute, aggressive character <laughs> to give a false impression of someone who's in control in Ottawa. Hence Harper says this uh, texter. Uh, what about, what do you make of the PQ's uh, so-called charter of uh, values banning hijabs, kippahs, and turbans in the public service? You know, there's one thing I really hate in politics, uh, is people who, politicians who set Canadians against each other, who divide Canadians. And I just think this is um, a cynical political ploy by a party that 
wants to mobilize a base in the worst kind of way, um, I, I, can't, I, I can't tell you how. It actually makes me angry. Um, and, and I hope that uh, I see that Monsieur Parizeau, even Monsieur Parizeau thinks it's gone too far. It's the first time in my lifetime I can remember agreeing with anything Mr. Parizeau said. But, you know, I, I, I just think you also, I know Montreal, I don't live here, but I know it well enough to know this is a society that works. It's complicated. It's not easy, but it works. Where's the problem here exactly? And anybody who thinks it's justifiable to ban access to public employment because you're wearing a religious, uh, religious sign doesn't understand what human rights are, doesn't understand what the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is all about, and doesn't understand what so-called Quebec values are all about. I mean, I, I, don't get me started. I just think it's, a, it's awful. Well, that's, that's pretty clear and concise. Now, obviously, this is not your first book. Uh, you've written a, a number. You're, you're quoted as saying this was the most difficult to write. Why is that? Well, I think it was difficult, I mean, because you've got to get a certain kind of uh, bitterness out of your system. You've got to accept defeat. You've got to go through defeat, come out the other side. I didn't want to write a book that was settling scores. I didn't want to write a book that had meanness in it. But yeah, I wrote the first draft. My wife said, put it away, start again. You know, so you have to you have to come to terms with your own emotions. And, and I think one of the purposes of the book is to say, look, yeah, it is a tough game, but I really want other people to go in. I mean, the, the book ends with a, with a kind of almost a plea to young Canadians not to be put off by the cynicism, not to be put off by the disillusion and commit themselves because, you know, the other thing I saw in politics was I saw some real nobility. I saw some people who were in there for the right reason, not just in my party, but in all parties. And so it's a book in praise of politics, not just in criticism of politics. But getting to that moment of being positive wasn't always easy. What was in that first draft that your wife told you to read too? <laughs> What's not in the book? Well, it just the kind of feelings of bitterness, feelings of anger. Um, I think also it takes a while to accept responsibility for your mistakes. You know, you got to, there's an aspect of you got to fess up, you got to, you got to admit that certain things that you could have done better. You have to come, you have to be honest about that kind of stuff. So, and I also wanted to write a book that also that wasn't a standard political memoir. You know, I teach political science, political theory, and the history of politics, and I wanted to kind of fill it full of some of the stuff that I, that I know from the classroom. It's not an academic book. I hope it's a good read, but I wanted to give it some, as they say, shelf life, you know, so that it wouldn't just be about the moment that I was in politics, but about politics in general. Your questions for Michael Ignatieff. This one says, uh, Mr. Ignatieff commented a while back that Quebec would one day separate. Could you elaborate on that? Oh, I don't. Look, I think it's always possible. The thing about Canada is that we, we keep having to convince each other to stay in the same house. Uh, but I'm confident we can. I just don't think there, there's, there's any, you know, it's not like the United States. The union is not eternal here. It, it could break up. We have to keep working at it, keep working at it, keep working at it. And as long as we're prepared to do so, I'm confident we'll stay together. Dave wants to know if you've ever thought about getting into radio. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm in front of a pro here. I, I'm not try, I'm not going after his job. <laughs> Michael Ignatieff, uh, my guess, if you had one uh, piece of advice, you said you want young people to still get involved. Uh, what would you tell them? How would you tell them to deal with all of the challenges? Never take it personally. It's the hardest lesson in politics, but. Never take it personally. Never let it get inside. Never let it get into the machine room and bother you. you got to develop skin like a crocodile. Thank you very much for joining us. Michael Ignatius, the book is called Fire and Ashes.